Thank you very much. It's joy and honor to uh, be presenting uh, to you this morning or afternoon on uh, something I've been very interested in over the last decade, ergonomics in ophthalmology. And I think one of the critical elements is how to have a long career in ophthalmology. Ergonomics is defined as a body of knowledge of the human's ability, limitations, and design. Uh, ergonomic design is the application of this body of knowledge to the design of tools, machines, systems, and everything we do in ophthalmology and our everyday life. Musculoskeletal disorders are something that I'll talk about a lot, and we call that MSD. And it's related to problems that you develop on an everyday basis related to your work and at home life. It all relates to wear and tear on the body over time that can lead to injury. And injuries result in decreased ability to work and your livelihood. So first, how common is musculoskeletal disorders in ophthalmologists? And the answer is very common. Most of us, you, suffer from these symptoms on a regular basis. We did a first survey of ophthalmologists in the United States, looking at 700 ophthalmologists, and about 52% of those who reported back to us via the survey described symptoms in the last month of lower back pain, upper extremity pain, or neck pain. And about 15% of them were moderately limited in their work as a result of these symptoms. And this survey was done probably about 15 years ago, and certainly our volumes have significantly increased over the years. But neck pain, back pain, or all associated with increased activity at work. And upper extremity pain was associated with the female gender. And the reason why gender may be important is because there are two possible explanations that occur not only in ophthalmology, but throughout all industries in life in general. That women have high demands at work and then have high demands at home as well. There also may be some sex-linked biological factors, such as hormones, but probably more physiology, uh, shorter stature, shorter reach, that probably increase the risk of ergonomic injury in females. And as that's what I just mentioned here, shorter stature, arm reach, and clothing necessitates accommodation at the slip lamp as well. Another study was done at the University of Iowa and the Mayo Clinic of 94 ophthalmologists and 92 family medicine doctors, also looking at symptom quality and severity over the previous 30 days. And again, neck pain, hand wrist pain, lower back pain, much more common in ophthalmologists than in family medicine doctors. And what's to happen in the future? Well, we anticipate significantly more risk of musculoskeletal disorders because we have increasing demand for our services. Certainly that's the case here in Egypt as well. And increasing age of practitioners. And what does this mean? Loss of work days, loss of income, and affecting your leisure activity. Not everyone gets musculoskeletal disorders, but awkward postures, repetitive motions, long durations, high forces, these are things that we engage in every day in our ophthalmology lives. And these are important risk factors for you in terms of development of musculoskeletal disorders. Age, gender, height, weight, these are other variables that will also play a role in the development of injuries for you during your lives. 
the Academy of Ophthalmology set up a task force, which I was chair of, where we looked at various clinic exposures as well as exposures to the operating room and office that may increase your risk of ergonomic injury over time. And I'll show you some examples of these, but you can also get more information at the American Academy of Ophthalmology website where we developed a CME course that's available for you via download and you can get all these slides online. So we heard a little bit about electronic medical records and we do a lot of that in the United States, but we also write. And the first message that I'll say is, it's much less demanding to sit down and write rather than lean over and stand and write and bending over. Over time, this, will, this bending over will lead to significant musculoskeletal injury. The next area that I'd like to, you to pay attention to is when you sit down, put your feet on the floor. Don't use uh, the chair footrest, but transfer your weight onto the floor and use the backrest of your chair. Watch your neck flexion. On the right hand side, you'll see the doctor bending over quite a bit. Raise the table, lower the chair, but decrease your neck flexion. That will decrease your risk. Here's a few of the doctors you'll see this morning or afternoon talking to us, and they all have various ways that they're not using the intended uh, benefits of the chair in order to decrease your risk. Use the backrest, uh, don't slump in your chair, everything that your mother and your father told you earlier in your lives. The chairs, the chairs are very deep. Putting a pad in the back of the chair behind the patient will allow the patient to move forward rather than the patient's telling you to move forward, you should have the patient move to you. Many of them can't and putting a wedge in the back of the chair will help. But one of the biggest challenges is this issue about the patient moving forward rather than you moving forward and leaning forward. Have the patient move forward on the chair. That is a critical element in your exam. And this is something that I see all the time. After I'm done in the after one of my residents or fellows are done in the room, they don't lower the patient's chair down, but they just keep it at the same point where they were examining the patient before. I come in and I can't get the coasters, the wheels of my chair under the footrest of the patient. It's incredibly important. If this is one of the biggest takeaway lessons that you can learn today is raise the patient's chair so that you can get your exam chair's wheels underneath that footrest. That will allow you to be in a much more neutral position. This is a personally designed uh, slip lamp table by Keith Barrett's at the Mayo Clinic. This is great, it has tapered edges, it's shorter, it's less width, but it's not absolutely necessary to do this, but this is one way that he was able to overcome some of the ergonomic challenges that he had with the design of his slip lamp table. And here is Keith on, on the right. He's in a much more neutral position. He's using some slanted oculars that are developed by Hog Stripe that you can use, but he's also not supporting his upper extremity on the right. And obviously, on the left-hand side, don't do what Meharry Gepremian is doing in terms of slouching over and putting all of his force on his elbow on a hard object. And this is something that we've all been trained to do, is to use our lens cases, which are hard metal, in order to support your elbow. Instead, using silicone discs will help you, or some kind of device, to allow you to support your elbow on a soft surface. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see Dr. Guaha. He starts off examining the left eye, and he's, he's neutral there, but then when he goes and looks at the right eye, he does not move his exam 
front chair over to the right a couple of inches. So then he torques over to the right in order to examine the patient. Move your exam chair a couple of centimeters to the right hand side in order to be neutral for that second eye. Keep your wrist straight. Don't flex it, don't extend it, but keeping your wrist straight will allow you to decrease your risk of carpal tunnel. And we talked before about some factors, such as high force. This is my lens, and it's no longer circular around the edges of it. There are edges that are bent in from the high force and pressure that I'm using to hold the lens. Soften the grip on your lens, and that will decrease the pressures within your carpal tunnel. Indirect ophthalmoscopy, the wire. Make sure the wire is not curved and doesn't get caught in any of the drawers in, in your exam room. Raise the table, raise the chair. This flexion on the left, this doctor is way too flexed and will result in significant neck injury over time. Raise the chair. It only takes three to four seconds to do, but will decrease the flexion on your neck. This hurts me to look at how I examined the patient here and the considerable contortions that I'm using to examine the patient. But this is downright painful to look at this. But we do this every day. We give a lot of injections in the office. And I know you do a lot of them perhaps in the operating room, but we do a lot in the office. And we're bending and flexing and twisting and turning all day. On the right hand side of the screen, someone developed these trays, these tables that you can use in the office that you can raise up and down to decrease the flexion on your neck and make the instruments much more uh, available for you so that you're not going back and forth throughout. Laser is very difficult, and I know you do a lot of laser here. Uh, this doctor, we talked about the female risk factors of the gender, and here you have a shorter stature, and so she needs a Kleenex box, about three laser supports in order to get her elbow supported. But then she has significant flexion, I'm, I'm sorry, extension of her wrist. Try to keep it neutral as way on the left. And this doctor's not using the back support during laser. These are long procedures. And using the back support will really decrease your risks over time. And it's not just the physicians. It's also our staff. Our staff are copying exactly what we're doing, and we want them to be available to us in the office and not be out because of neck and back issues. They need to copy good behavior that we're using as well throughout the day. And it's not just in the exam room, it's in your offices as well. We all multitask. We do a lot of things all at the, at the same time. Try not to cradle the phone with your head. In the operating room, it's a real problem as well. We use a lot of crank beds. If you can use electric beds, that will significantly decrease your risk. It starts with even the draping and prepping. Look at this angle on this doctor. Try to lift up the table. That will reduce the flexion. And peri bulbar blocks, same issues. The key element in this slide is the eyepieces of your microscope need to be set slightly below the sitting eye height. And try to use a wrist rest. This is Dr. Kotran. Uh, without a wrist rest, that creates significant issues with shoulder retraction, holding the shoulders for a long period of time in the same position. Tilt your microscope. That will allow a much more neutral position. And we heard before about the microscope pedals and setting up the operating room to be comfortable for fake emulsification. 
One of the issues is that the microscope petals can be of different heights. If they are of different heights, put some towels underneath that microscope petal in order to make them the same height so that you're not torqued one way or the other. And I mentioned this just before, tilting that microscope just a little bit may allow you to be in a much more neutral position. We do a lot of prolonged precision gripping of instruments. Try to relax every now and then. Take a break even for five seconds. That's very important. On the American Academy of Ophthalmology website, we have a whole section devoted to stretching activities prior to and during the daytime. That will significantly decrease your risk. We had a physical therapist develop these activities uh, for us ophthalmologists, and I encourage you to go to the Academy of Ophthalmology One Network website where we have all these uh, exercises carefully outlined for you, and it's available for everyone, free. So, bottom line is what you can do right now, sit correctly with proper lumbar support, Consider ergonomic chairs and stools. Adjust your oculars if necessary. Avoid twisting. Letting the patient come to you rather than you come to them. Design the height and location of the tables to minimize these activities. Reduce contact stress. Take the edges off the tables, but use some soft jet silicone material for your elbows. Good ergonomic practices start early in life and they will result in significant improvement in both your personal and professional life. The results are slow, but the bottom line is that from a study from the Dental Society in the, the Dutch Dental Society, 50% of dentists adopted all or most of their ergonomic recommendations. 40% adopted some of them, and 72% had decreased their total resolution of their main complaints. This is something that all of us can do. We can do it on a daily basis, and it will result in a significant longevity to your career, and I hope improvement in your personal lives as well, because you're not suffering from chronic pain. So I thank you very much for your attention, and best of luck to all of you.